Good morning. Whether you're here in person or joining us from your classrooms, I would like to formally welcome you all to the 2021 St. Augustine Lecture. While we have had to adapt common Austin Prep capstone events, I'm very happy that we are able to come together to keep the tradition of the St. Augustine Lecture uninterrupted. As you know, our theme for this year and this lecture is taken from the Gospel of St. John. I pray that they all may be one. This theme for the 2020 through 2021 academic year is an appropriate one, as our nation struggles with, with much polarization, division, and racial injustice. And as we slowly approach a more normal and ideal world, resulting in more people coming together, I can't think of a better theme for this lecture. As you listen to the words shared with you today, I encourage you all to absorb and comprehend what you hear. Today is an opportunity to take a break from our busy and overwhelming lives and learn from the wisdom of someone who has much wisdom to share. To my fellow seniors, while we may be a week away from our last day of school, it is never too late to grow to the Austin Prep community. Use today as an opportunity to grow in wisdom as we prepare to enter the next phase of our lives. And to the juniors joining me in person, as you prepare to emerge as the leaders of this school next year, today is a great opportunity to deepen your connection to the Austin Prep community and make it a better place. The same is true to all students in both the middle school and upper school. I hope you walk away from this lecture with more knowledge, insight, and perspective so that you can lead in the work ahead and work to answer the prayer that we may all be one. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I know it's first day back. Everybody's still thinking about last week. There was some, there was some good weather in there. Hopefully, you all had some downtime. And I'm very grateful to the junior class for you being here this morning. The St. Augustine Lecture looks a little bit different than it ordinarily does. We continue to adapt and make the best out of uh, very challenging and, and strange times. The St. Augustine Lecture was started a number of years ago to raise the intellectual life of Austin Prep, to expose our students to people with greater wisdom, people who have different experiences, who have tra traveled farther down the road than, than we have. Uh, to give you a sense, because some of this happened before you were students here at Austin Prep, we've had a, a number of interesting people be with us for the St. Augustine Lecture. We've had a two-star general, come and share his experience on leadership. We had uh, a cabinet official who worked in the Bush administration who happened to be with President Bush on 9-11 come and share his perspective about the nobility of working in public service. We've had college presidents. We've had heads of schools. Um, all people with an interesting perspective on life that they can share from their experience that hopefully will enrich your journey. In addition to COVID that we've all been struggling with the last, uh, I don't know, 13 months or so, our nation has also been struggling with um, doing better, doing more, increasing our efforts, strengthening our commitment to greater racial justice in the United States and around the world. We have, as a school, adopted a, a theme from the Gospel of John, I pray that they all may be one. This year's St. Augustine Lecture is perfect to talk a little bit about that, give greater insight into that cause and framed within the context of the church's teaching. We have with us this morning Father Brian Ayer, who is a native of Lowell, Massachusetts. He is a Roman Catholic priest here in the Archdiocese of Boston, and he is secretary to Cardinal O'Malley for social services. Uh, he was ordained in 1966, that was before I was born. Uh, in addition to his work in the Archdiocese, Father has served as the Parker Gilbert Montgomery Professor of Practice of Religion and Public Life at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, he was formerly the Dean of the, uh, the Harvard School of Divinity. His teaching, research, and writing focus on ethics and foreign policy and the role of religion in world politics and in, and in American society. Uh, please join me in welcoming Father Brian there. Father?
Thank you, Dr. Hickey, and good morning to everyone. I can't really see your faces very well, but I know you're there, and, and therefore, by an act of faith, I'll, we are connected. But I am delighted to be here today, especially as I hear predecessors uh, in this lectureship uh, who have come to this podium on days that were more normal, if you will, but I am happy to come uh, under the restraints of COVID, which we all are held to even for these days and some days ahead. Dr. Hickey gave me the theme of uh, that all may be one, and I will use that theme as I move through three steps of this lecture. I want to talk first of all where the theme comes from and what its original meaning was and to some degree is. Secondly, I then want to broaden the theme and use it in a wider sense that it was originally used. And then thirdly, I will turn to discuss briefly, but at the heart of things, what kind of resources we need as individuals, as a community of the church, as a school, and as a country, the kind of resources we need in order to honor the theme that all may be one. So where does the phrase come from? It is, of course, the words of Jesus himself found in John's Gospel. Now, the setting for this is unique. As you know, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke sort of fit together. They have the same structure. They have a certain similarity of style. John's Gospel is always different. It was written last of all the Gospels. Mark's Gospel, the first written Gospel, roughly dates from around the year 60. John's Gospel is not written until the last decade uh, of the century, 90 to 100. And his themes are somewhat different. So to, the phrase we use today comes from the Last Supper. Jesus is gathered with his disciples on the night before he dies. And while Matthew, Mark, and Luke concentrate on the institution of the Eucharist, take this bread, it is my body, drink this wine, it is my blood, John never mentions that. He has a whole chapter earlier in his gospel about the Eucharist, but he never mentions the institution. What John does is to give us four chapters, chapter 13 to 17, which is a long reflective conversation by Jesus with his original disciples. It is like his last will and testament. His death is less than 24 hours ahead. The Garden of Gethsemane is less than an hour ahead. And so he gathers with his disciples for his last will and testament. The dialogue he has is fascinating. We will hear more of it on Sundays approaching Pentecost. But then at a certain moment in chapter 17, John simply says, and then Jesus raised his eyes to heaven. And all of a sudden, we move from a conversation to prayer. And what is his prayer? His prayer is for the church he is entrusting to these people and entrusts to us two millennia later. And what is his prayer for the church? That the church might be one, unified in its truth, unified in its witness. He says it explicitly, I pray that you will be one so that the world will come to believe what I have taught, who I am, and what kind of world I hope you, the church, can produce. So it is from that setting that the phrase comes, I pray, Father, that they may be one. Indeed, he goes beyond it and says, I pray that the church may be one as you, Father, and I are one. 
So he takes the unity of the Trinity and says, that is my gift to the church. But that is my task for the church, that they may be one. Now, that phrase has stood before us down through the centuries. And because we're human as a church, imperfect as a church, unfortunately, the phrase is still an aspiration. It's what we hope to be. Because in the 11th century, there was the first division of the Christian church, east and west. The Orthodox church arose from that. And then in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation, the split among the Western church. Now, in the middle of the 20th century, we had a great pope, and you all only will know him by memory. I think Dr. Hickey's too young to know him. John XXIII, who called the Second Vatican Council. And the reason he called it was he said, I would like to unify the churches once again, that they may be one. So this is an ancient phrase that Dr. Hickey has chosen. And it is a phrase that is still an aspiration to us as we struggle to be the church that Christ wants us to be. My first point, that's where it came from, that's what it meant, that's what it still means, an aspiration, a command, a mandate, but unfulfilled. And insofar as we don't fulfill that, it's harder to fulfill other things, but we've got to work at it. So now I'd like to go more broadly. I'd like to take this religious phrase and locate it in a secular setting. The secular setting of our own country, for the church lives as part of a society, as part of a country. And interestingly enough, just as there is this phrase, as ancient as the church is, there is another ancient phrase younger, but still ancient, that arises out of our country and its history. That phrase is e pluribus unum. From the many, we seek to create one. That phrase was adopted early in our country's history. From the many who are here, we seek to create the unity of a country. And like the phrase that they all may be one, e pluribus unum, is also an aspiration. Has always been. Great ideas usually are so rich, they're always a step ahead of us. We step into them. We grow into them. We violate them, and we have to get up and start again. So it is with all may be one, and so it is with e pluribus unum. But in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of a very difficult setting, realizing e pluribus unum may be particularly difficult. And so I thought what I would say a few words about are the challenges to the phrase, what the specific elements are that we have to work our way through as we try to aspire to this phrase. So let's quickly go through race, immigration, ethnicity, and religion. Four different lines four different dimensions of our life as a country and what it means to work at e pluribus unum. My point here is not to deal with any of these things in specific terms. We'd be here till tomorrow, and I know I don't have any votes for that in the audience. So I'm trying to identify a challenge rather than analyze a problem appropriate. But my point is history. 
and how these challenges have been with us for a long time, but surface now in a particular way. Race. Many of you, maybe all of you, maybe in class, will have heard about the 1619 Project. The 1619 Project was a project that was sponsored by the New York Times, I believe, and it adopted the phrase 1619 during the year 2019. So 400 years of the history of slavery. And it was an academic product project, and its product is still known. It drew some criticism, and it drew a lot of praise. But the point was to say that this challenge to e pluribus unum has been there from the beginning, pre the Declaration of Independence, pre the Constitution. From the beginning, people arrived on these shores who had not chosen to come. And they arrived in chains. And that was a kind of symbolic mark that said, this is going to be difficult. And so it begins. And like a red thread, race runs through our history. It runs through it filled with both ambiguity, tragedy, and moral failure. A Jefferson who could write the Declaration of Independence, words that the world knows, a Jefferson who owned slaves and abused some. How do you come to grips with that one? And you move from Jefferson to Lincoln. And the struggle the 16th president had about what to do about a country on the verge of tearing itself apart. And Lincoln himself struggled with this question. At one point, he said, I would do anything to save the Union. And then as time progressed, he decided if the Union had to be divided to save the dignity of everyone, that was necessary, tragic. And the struggle continues into our own century. You go from Jefferson to Lincoln to Martin Luther King, who created a moral crisis in the conscience of the country. And it was a major step. And those of us old enough that have been around then, I think often think of it as the first chapter of the civil rights struggle. And this past year, the second chapter. In the first chapter, the issues were about law and policy. The second chapter is deeper. The question of what does systemic racism mean? We think of racism as a flaw of character a person would have. But systemic racism is when it gets embodied in law and policy and custom, and we sort of don't know it's there. E pluribus unum, the first challenge. Immigration, again, part of our history from very early on. The first immigrants were white Northern Europeans and Protestants. They came to our shores, they came to our Commonwealth. They've had an enormous influence on the history of the country but they were immigrants. There were people here before them, the indigenous Native American. There was a country here before them in terms of territory. But immigration then really became a major part of the history in the middle of the 19th century. Waves of immigrants, again, Northern Europe, Central Europe, Ireland, very Catholic story. 
And that wave lasted from 1840 till at least 1920 when there was a battle about should we stop immigration. And then it continues on till today. We live at a time when the mass movement of humanity across the globe is larger, deeper, and broader than it has ever been in history. So no surprise that we're struggling with this question. But again, a history, and again, ambiguity fits in. One part of our history is the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your hungry, your poor. I'll open the doors here. This is a land you can come to and be welcomed. And then the periodic struggles to close the gates. And so it is that we still struggle with this question. The Statue of Liberty still stands. Again, an aspiration. And the struggle to close the gates or to open them is still with us. It's with us at the border, but it's with us in our towns, our cities, our legislatures. 11 million undocumented people without any legal status here in our midst. 800 dreamers who've had the same experience you've had, the chance to go to schools in the United States and to plan a life, and all of a sudden they find out it could be taken away from them in a moment. That all may be one. Out of the many, we seek to create one. Immigration, a question of law, policy, but at its heart, a moral question. And immigration then leads to ethnicity. We are not only a multicultural society, a multiracial society, a multireligious society, a multi-ethnic society. Ethnicity has been part of our fabric also. But every now and then, something sparks where what is taken for granted and lived with peacefully all of a sudden becomes a point of conflict. So right now we have this astounding kind of outbreak against Asian Americans. A relatively small community who have made extraordinary contributions as all immigrants have in their own way. And now they get attacked in our streets and blamed for things they have nothing to do with. Race, immigration, ethnicity, e pluribus unum, that all may be one. And then there's religion. You might think religion's the cure for the other three. Well, hopefully it's partially a cure. But religion has its own sins to confess from the past. Race and religion in the United States. Ambiguity. The black church kept the black community alive. The white church struggled with it. There's a famous event when Martin Luther King was jailed for a protest mass uh, march in that chapter one of the civil rights struggle. And he was jailed. And the white ministers of the city came to him and said, you're causing a lot of difficulty. We respect you, we like you. And so Martin Luther King wrote a, minute, wrote a letter from the Birmingham jail to the white ministers and priests of the city. Everyone knows the name Martin Luther King. None of us know those whom he criticized. 
It's a lot about thinking about where we stand on an issue and how we're remembered. So religion has the resources to be a, a help to deal with race, a help to deal with immigration and inequality, but religion has to be true to itself. No surprise that we have confessionals. We think of those in personal terms, but when we struggle with e pluribus unum, it's a communal question. What our institutions do, what we say or don't say. And so it is that this is not meant to be a source of discouragement. The aspirations that all may be one are as true today as they were at the night of the Last Supper. E pluribus unum is as valid a goal for this society and not only valid but possible of realization. Deep truths keep alive for us the next mountain to climb. So finally, what kind of resources? Well, I'm in a Catholic school, so I begin with a very fundamental Catholic truth, faith and reason. As Catholics, we believe that we have two ways to learn, to learn who we are, to learn who God is, to learn what we should be, to learn what kind of community we should try to build. One source is revelation, like John's gospel, all the gospel, the moral teaching of the Catholic Church. That's one source. The other source is reason, what you spend your days here, here doing. And we think those two things go together. Faith is not unreasonable, and faith should never promote something that is less than reasonable. And faith and reason are our two sources. Out of faith and reason, I think, come two great truths that at least can be foundational for pursuing these aspirations that are so much a challenge for us. But I think every now and then you reduce things to fundamental clarity. Two great truths, the dignity of the human person and the value of every human life. If those two truths are the place where we start every time we debate race, immigration, ethnicity, if those two truths are the place where the legislatures start, where the leadership chosen at every level of the country start, the rest of the discussion moves in a certain way. The dignity of the person. From a religious point of view, you might want to call it the sacredness of the person, because that's really what it's about. But I've lived in university settings uh, where, which have been wonderful, but I live with colleagues for whom terms like sacredness, faith, religion simply do not penetrate. Brilliant people. But dignity is a term that cuts across religious and secular. And it doesn't cancel out what we mean by sacredness. Because basically, in terms of our Catholic faith, the reason why we absolutely must honor the dignity of every person is for two reasons. One, God created each of us. And two, Christ entered our humanity and is brother to each of us. 
but also brother to everyone else. The double consecration of the human person. The dignity of the person then spins out into other truths. If people have dignity, then they have rights. If there are rights of some, there are rights of all. Moral argument is coercive. Dignity to rights, rights to social claims, duties along with rights. The creation of what we call the common good, the good of everyone, not the good of a few. That's where the dignity argument leads. The value of human life. How do we respect it? How do we protect it? How do we think about it when our society has intense debates about closing the border or opening the border, about welcoming people or not? Life, in theological terms, I think, is always a mystery, a gift, and a responsibility. Human life is a mystery because it is of God and of us. The universal reaction to a birth. But the deeper truth, it's of God and of us. And then life becomes a gift. So if we violate dignity and don't honor life, it is the very gift of God that is at stake. That may be hard argument to make in the middle of a Senate vote, but that's what we're called to do, not just Senate votes, but the daily fabric of life. And finally, life that is a gift is a responsibility. So we're heirs to these two large truths that all may be one, and from many we can create one. One final thought. For us as Christians, one of the things we need to remember, I think, is people watch because precisely because of what we say. So one story. It was at the end of World War II where Europe was devastated, where the idea of the Holocaust was just arising in, human, in, in, in people's minds. And the Dominicans, they weren't the Augustinians, but the Dominicans invited to speak to them the famous Nobel Prize winning author, Albert Camus. And Camus said he would come and talk to the Dominicans about how he, as an agnostic, couldn't quite believe how he, as an agnostic, dealt with the fact of evil in life. And when he came to the end of the talk in which he criticized the church for not saying enough about the Holocaust during the war, at the end of the talk, he said, it may not be possible for us to create a world in which no innocent children suffer. But it is possible to create a world in which fewer innocent children suffer. And if we look to the Christians and don't find help, where else will we go? People watch us, and that makes a difference. Thank you. Father, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you sharing your, your insights, both uh, theological and, and historical, with the, with the community of Austin Prep. We have some students who have some questions that uh, uh, hopefully you'll be able to give some greater insight into that. So who do we have? Father, you're going to help us. Father Patrick Armano is going to help facilitate that. And our first question is from Patricia Bebo. Understanding that we hold our own values that are important to us, how do we still understand or work toward unity? 
So uh, I looked at all these questions. You've got smart students if they produce these things. <laughs> <laughs> these are easier than ones I've gotten in other settings. So we'll start, Patricia. So we hold our own values. Uh, uh, and I, the implication of the question is other people have other values. So how do you put values together? The statement of the question is just right. Okay. So we hold our own. Why do we hold the values? Because by a process of learning, reflection, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, we hope. We come to conclusions about things that are to be valued. So they ground us. And the way values grounds us is they always stand before us. And then they measure how we act against them. So then we come into a setting where the value that we hold dear is not even known by someone else. Or they look at the same reality we do, and they have a different value that they bring to it. So my sense is we take a couple of steps. We don't let go of what we believe. We listen carefully to the other person's reasons either for not believing us, what we hold, or because they think that maybe our value is too narrow and they've got a wider value. So we listen carefully. We think again about what it is we value. I think usually, if we're talking about lifetime values, we will conclude we're on to something. But we have enough mix of humility to say, I understand why you find my value too narrow, insufficient. But I also understand I may learn something from you. And maybe I can explain the value that I hold in a different way than it's been explained to you. And so I want to listen to you to see if that will enhance what I already know is true, but maybe too narrow. And I hope you would be willing to listen to me about why I hold what I hold and maybe even how a step ahead, two of us will find a value that reflects what each of us holds. Makes for difficult days, but that's a good question. Thank you. Our second question is from Jenna Nadel. Is there such thing as absolute truth? And if so, how do we hold on to that while building a more diverse society? Yes, um, I do think there are absolute truths. What I mean by that, it's a truth that whose content is universal. That is to say, it applies to everyone. I think the dignity of the human person is an absolute truth. To treat a person as a thing, to treat a person as a sub in a subhuman way, and that happens a lot in society in different ways. So I think there are such a thing as absolute truths. Now, are there hundreds of them? Probably not. One of the things that makes absolute truths so important is that they are so deep that you're not going to get scores of them. So you can have absolute truths, and then you can have other approximations of the truth that fill in a picture. But uh, how do we build a more diverse society? Well, you see, the value of an absolute truth is that you want to build the right kind of a society. If someone says, you know, I think the dignity of the human person means that everyone should, should look Norwegian. You know, that's going to be not a good idea to build a society on that basis. But I do think that if we hold on to them, 
it's almost like the first question. It's not, on, it's not different than the first question. Clashing values. I think there are a core set of absolute truths. As I say, I think the dignity of the human person is, is an absolute truth. I think the concept of rights is an absolute truth. The concept. Now, what content you give to the rights can vary. Um, so I, I think that there's a way in which core absolute truths exist, but think of them as an inner circle to a set of concentric circles. And so if you try to build the fabric out of which a society will be built, there's an inner core, and then the next circle, and the next circle, and the next circle. And when you're out 15 or 16 circles, it may be a debate about the Red Sox and the Yankees, you know, but those are further out. But at the core, and coming out from the core, there are things on which you can then build a society. My sense. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is by Ben Sterling. Picking up from where the others left off, well, we should respect other people's ideas. Is it legitimate to draw a line when those ideas are destructive? Yes. That has to be true. <laughs> because other than that, then everything is in free fall. Yes. Now, it all depends on the, the basis for which we draw the line and identify something that's destructive. And it also depends on the style with which we draw the line, okay? Uh, so I think, uh, I, you know, your, question, your three questions interact, interestingly. You know, the first question was asked about values. The second question was asked about values and diversity. The third question then is, in a society where there's a diversity of values, is there some points at which you draw a line and say, beyond that line is not value. Beyond that line is moral evil. So you serve the purpose of the welfare of people by drawing lines. Line drawing is inherent in moral argument. Line drawing is inherent in the way you build a society and govern a society. So absolutely, we should draw a line. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question is from Ernie Little. Free will and freedom is essential for all people. How do we hold that intention with the importance of unity? So uh, that, that question takes us back to who we are. Uh, I, said, uh, I said that uh, every human life is a mystery, a gift, and a responsibility. I think that relates to this. So the question is, how did God create us? Or to put it another way, why is there a uniqueness to human dignity? And my answer to that is the Catholic tradition. Uh, the, what gives the ultimate dignity to each person is that God has invested persons with two great gifts, the intelligence to know and the freedom to choose. So the question about freedom is crucial in protecting human dignity. Now, again, the question is, what do we use our freedom for? Or what does anyone use their freedom for? Or how does the society draw a line and say, if that's what you think is freedom, we are not going to allow it. We're not going we're not going to allow racist behavior in this school, in this city, in this town. So freedom is essential. It is part of who we are. Freedom is, it is from freedom that we make choices about our values. It is from the freedom to choose that we identify absolute truths and in light of that are willing to stand in defense of them and in light of that, to draw a line against values and other statements that are not, uh, that are destructive and not helpful. Thank you. Our next question is uh, from Steve Galatis. 
Is it important that religious people be willing to give up certain beliefs in order to have a diverse and inclusive community? And I think the rest of it is, should religions be trying to change those beliefs? I think it was a two-part question, fine. Um, I think it's important for religious people and religious communities to be convinced that there is such a thing as truth, that it can be grasped, and that when we grasp a truth, an absolute truth, or a less than absolute truth, but a truth, that we hold on to it. I also think that a religious community needs modesty and humility about the truths it holds. I don't mean that we should be flabby about the truths we hold. I don't mean that we should, uh, in a sense, uh, 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 be willing to change a belief uh, for just any reason. But I think there's no question that religious communities have grown over time in terms of what they believe and what they hold. Now again, our beliefs are like our values. They're concentric circles. So if I tried to draw the concentric circles of a Catholic sketch of things, at the center is going to be the Trinity. There is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Secondly, at that core, as St. John's Gospel tells us, the Word was with God and the Word became flesh. Jesus of Nazareth is the central person of human history. Coming out from that, we then start looking at a next circle. Uh, how did Jesus teach? Well, that's where we get into a community of believers and teaching. And then we go out step by step. And we should, we, over time, will find truths that have been held, or at least positions, I would put it differently. We will find positions that have been held that we believe need to be changed. How do we change on a principle we've held? One of two ways, either further examination of the basis of the principle as it has been held is seen to be either too limited or maybe mistaken. That's one way to change. A second way to change is to have questions put to us that we haven't thought about before. And the question may not bring us to change our position or principle, but we may need to broaden the sense. For a long time, the Catholic Church believed that the idea of religious freedom, that everyone should be free to search out religious truth as they, as they saw fit. The Catholic Church saw that, that truth as a threat to the unity of society. That is to say, if you could have multiple religious truths, society would be torn apart. And for a long time, Catholicism did not hold what we today call the right to religious freedom. It did say no one should be forced to believe something, but it also said that the state could set limits to persons' freedom if what they were espousing threatened the unity of society. Catholic Church at the Second Vatican Council changed its position. Now, people will fight me on that, but I'm willing to show up for the debate. It changed its position. It changed its position because of scholarship internally and because it learned things from secular society, including our own. Central to the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, the document on religious liberty, was basically authored by an American Jesuit who had spent his life probing what we thought about religious freedom and believing that it was too narrow. For doing that, he was forbidden to write or teach for a period of time in his life. When the Second Vatican Council was called, he was invited to the Second Vatican Council and basically wrote the document that said, the dignity of the person 
requires the right to religious freedom so the person may search for God using his or her freedom and intelligence. So we need to have stability of what we hold and modesty of how we hold it and be ready to develop and even change in some instances. But since there are some absolute truths, I certainly wouldn't change them. Thank you. And our last question is uh, from Olivia Doherty. What are the steps that we, as a Catholic community rooted in the teachings of St. Augustine, can take to work towards unity in our community? Well, first, understand how important St. Augustine is in the Catholic tradition. So as you learn from St. Augustine, you are in very good company. That's the first thing. Uh, usually, when we take different aspects of Catholic faith, some of it moral, some of it doctrinal, and you try to write a history, a broad history of it, generally it begins with the scriptures, and then you go to Augustine, and then you go to Aquinas, and then you go to the 16th and 17th century, and then you come to the 20th century. Now, in between, there's thousands of other voices, but Augustine is so important, so grounded, about so many different things that you're in a good place to learn from Augustine. And Augustine himself uh, struggled with how you interpret truth. So what I've taught for uh, principally for most of my life is about the ethics of war and peace. Augustine is fundamental to that. But Augustine struggled with the question, and I'll give you just an example of how how you use your intelligence and your freedom. Augustine basically uh, faced the question of could Catholics take life in warfare? Could Catholics fight for the Roman Empire was what the question was. And Augustine said this. He said, if it's a question of my life, someone wants to take my life, Augustine said, I will follow the example of Jesus who gave up his life. However, Augustine said, if the question is that someone else's life is being taken by aggression, he was talking in wide political terms, by aggression, he said, other people and the state have the right to intervene and if necessary, to take the aggressor's life to save the innocent. So Augustine himself had no doctrine of self-defense. He did have a doctrine we call justified warfare, and that has followed down through the centuries. Now, when you get to Aquinas, he acknowledged self-defense was possible. So again, you have a church that can grow and develop. So how can you use Augustine? I would say when you're into Augustine, you're into the heart of the meaning of Catholic faith. Learn about it. Secondly, to be Catholic, I think, is three things. To be scriptural, sacramental, and social. And when you talk about producing a community of people who can help build a wider human community, if we put together those three gifts, be grounded in the scriptures, and then the development of the teaching that comes from them, be fed by the sacraments, which gives us the power to love as Jesus taught love, and then to be social, meaning we, understanding, we understand that we are called to be builders of a human community that is one that honors the dignity of the human person. Now that human community is local, national, and global, and different people do different things, but the church as a whole will work uh, at all three of those levels. Thank you. I think that's it. One more round of applause for Father.
Father, thank you also for weaving in some of the teachings of Augustine into, the, into your remarks today. Uh, life is very complicated. There's a lot of complexities, and I think we all note that there are often paradoxes that surface. And, you know, I've noted from reading some of Augustine's teachings and observations that those paradoxes that exist today probably go back thousands of years. So some of the ones that we've pointed out to give, uh, to give you folks a couple of examples of, of Augustine, faith is to believe what you do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what you believe, which comes first. Uh, miracles are not contrary to nature, but only contrary to what we know about nature. And last, um, perhaps this touches upon you know, our, you know, our future you know, as a Catholic community and, and our commitment and our work towards becoming better people. Um, he who created us without our permission will not save us without our consent. Augustine always made these observations about how challenging it is. And Father, again, thank you for sharing your observations and insights of, you know, to help us discern and navigate the complexities of uh, life in the 21st century. Again, Father, thank you.